Okay, welcome back. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome Dr. Bradford S. Weeks. Uh, he's from the Weeks Clinic in Whidbey Island, Washington. Brad has been a, a longtime member of our association. He's a very faithful supporter. He's brought a number of people here this year. Uh, he's also one of our instructors. And we're just thrilled to have him speak every time he, he offers. So please give him a warm welcome, Dr. Bradford S. Weeks. Thank you. Well, um, I am going to keep this to 42 minutes. And uh, I will need your help on that. So we'll get started now. And I like to keep track. This, I'm, I'm happy to be here. And um, uh, here's to Stephen Ayers, who was my uh, teacher in this process initially in 2001. And uh, Gus, who's probably wandering around outside. Fabulous courage for Gus to put all this together here. Annie, all the team, all of the people who are making things happen. I'm very appreciative. And I thank you. And it's really, for me, it's, um, it's fabulous to look out on a group of people who have as much integrity and as much courage and principle as I think this group represents. So I come here for the knowledge I'll gain from my peers, but also to be inspired and to be encouraged. So I thank you all for your participation. Um, I, I am uh, doing something called corrective medicine and psychiatry. Corrective medicine simply suggests we try to correct the imbalances. Uh, it's another way of saying what we all do. But uh, it's the term that I've chosen, and it, uh, my patients understand that. So my goal today is to explain to you all to share the best that I can of what I value about my practice. Um, I am humbled, really, by uh, the speakers who've come before. Th these people are great scientists. Uh, I don't know if everybody followed Dr. Moon's presentation. I'm humbled by Dr. Moon, for example. I don't think I'll ever really understand what he does. So I'm not going to be speaking to you in any sense as a scientist like that. I'm one of those hard-working clinicians in the trenches trying to apply things. And I've had a lot of great uh, success, and I feel very fortunate in what we're doing with cancer patients, so I'll, I'll share that. Um, first thing I wanted to say is, uh, for some of us in the meeting uh, last night, Frank Schallenberger said, which of us would not choose IPT if we had cancer? And of course, uh, no hands went up, because all of us who understand this, if we had cancer, would choose IPT, and that speaks volumes. The question he didn't ask, though, is which of us would only use IPT if we had cancer? And again, in that case, no hands would have gone up. Because one of the big messages I want you to understand has to do with what's called cancer stem cells. Cancer stem cells are, in, in contradistinction to cancer tumor cells, are not responsive to chemotherapy and radiation. So even though IPT is a kinder and gentler way to do chemotherapy, it still is chemotherapy. And we need to do a lot more than simply chemotherapy. So I want to touch on some of that. I also uh, think that the most important uh, orientation I have to my practice, and I share it with you in case it fits, is what I call the trickle-down effect. And by that I mean I have, the, I have the belief and the experience that my, my thoughts affect my feelings. And my feelings affect my physiology. If I'm scared, that'll make some adrenaline happen. And my physiology affects my biochemistry. So why give Prozac, a biochemical substance, to affect the feelings and the thoughts? Why well, have to work up that chain starting with a biochemical substance, when you can take advantage of this extraordinary experience we all have of being able to think and to be able to frame our reality. So the trickle-down effect is to encourage people to pay attention to their thoughts and their beliefs. And uh, when I get to my slide lecture, the last slide, I think, is a great Ann Landers quote. And she says, if you can't be kind, be vague. And we all hate it when the doctor says to the patient, you have six weeks to live. Well, that's, I think that's close to criminal. At least he should be a little vague, like, 
the future is not rosy. But, but how dare he uh, trespass into the realm of belief and insert uh, with his white coat and everything else that, that belief system. So uh, this process of paying attention to our patient's thought processes and beliefs, this is where I start. And I, I think I, I just want to underscore that for us. Now I heard Dr. Moon say, in terms of epigenetics, I love this, he said, um, we decide our gene expression. Well, I would take that in a literal sense, that our thought process and our belief is an epigenetic factor that we need to pay attention to. And I think, um, I think uh, Bob had this great picture of the mastodon under the microscope. And of course, that's the fact that there's a human being in front of you. I remember in medical school, uh, one of my doctors said, the dumbest kidney is smarter than the smartest doctor. And we have to remember that the patient, almost unbeknownst to them, comes to the table with a huge momentum towards health, a tremendous capacity for spontaneous healing. And uh, it's the big white mastodon under the microscope that we have a human being. And, and that's, uh, that's got an infinite potential. So when I, when I hear the work about the, um, the molecular screening and so forth, I like all that, and I use those bio, uh, sensitive, the chemosensitivity tests, and I think it's fabulous. But it's not a genetic problem, I believe. I, I don't even think it's a cell wall deficient organism problem or a heavy metal toxicity problem. These things are cofactors. But it's fundamentally, in my opinion, uh, the cancer process begins with a belief. Uh, and that is why, does anybody know what group of patient populations has the lowest incidence of cancer? If you could have any diagnosis to avoid cancer, what would it be? Schizophrenia. Schizophrenia. So if I think I am the Lord Jesus Christ, God bless him, that's going to be a pretty good immune booster. <laughs> right? So it's a classic example of how our thoughts affect our immunology. And these people who believe, this irritating patient who comes into you and says, I don't have any need for chemotherapy, I'll be spontaneously healed. Do not dissuade that person of that belief. So the spontaneous healing, you know, uh, 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 Rick had this great quote from St. Augustine that miracles don't happen in contradiction to nature, but simply in contradiction to what we understand about nature. Humility is important there. I also want to remind us about the power of words. The, the, one of the main reasons why we speak in Latin and we, we we take someone who says, I have a sore joint, and you say, no, no, that's arthritis. Well, that's Latin, arthra, and itis, that's sore joint. So they say they have a sore joint, we say, no, 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 we know better, and we tell them the same thing in Latin. Fibromyalgia, sounds much better than I'm hurting everywhere. But the concept is, that's for our insecurities. The Bible says that, uh, uh, the Adam was given dominion and his, one of his charges was to name everything in Eden. Well, once you name something, you have dominion over it. I have a, I have a friend whose girlfriend tried to rename him and I, I counseled him against letting that happen. <laughs> um, uh, it happened anyway and they didn't last more than about a year. But, but when we name, the power of words which Bob mentioned earlier is very important. And so let's talk about terms in general. You know, what is a doctor? We know it's teacher, ducere, to lead or teach. And initially, remember it were the barbers who did the actual surgery and the doc physicians and surgeons, Columbia School of Physicians and Surgeons. A physician or a doctor traditionally didn't do a lot. Remember, they just kind of sat by the bedside and counseled. Antibiotics showed up in the 30s and it was a different deal. There was something the doctors could really offer. But for the most part, it was more of a guide or a coach. And the surgeons did things. What's curious about my role now is that I've been, now I'm doing things to people. I'm giving them chemotherapy. I never would have dreamed that I would do, you know, give chemotherapy. So we're not just counseling, we're also doing the, uh, the other work. But in terms of what a doctor is, if we remember that we are fundamentally teachers, that means we have to pay attention to the patient's thought process and the learning, and we have to encourage. Um, now, who is the patient? Well, I consider them a fourfold being. I'll say to the patient, I'll slap the knee and I'll say, this is not you. This knee, this physical body is not you. 
This physical body is your life support system without which you couldn't, as a spiritual being, walk on this earth. And you have feelings. That's also not you. You know, I am mad is different than I feel mad. Also nice to have our cancer patients not say, I am a cancer patient, but to say, I feel that I, I have cancer. So trying to, uh, without going into a lot of detail there, because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's for us to figure out for ourselves, the patient is there with a tremendous momentum and should be empowered to the greatest degree possible, in my opinion. Now, um, so what's a doctor? What's a patient? A doctor, I'm going to say, from my perspective, is primarily a teacher. And a patient is ideally an empowered collaborator working with the doctor towards the patient's goals. Don't presume the patient wants to live. I think that about 60% of my male cancer patients over 60 don't want to live. You have to ask them and they'll say, well, frankly, you know, my wife wants me to live, but I don't want to bankrupt my family. I'm tired. I'm ready to go. I don't want pain. You know, so what are we doing if they don't want to live? We certainly don't want to force vitality upon them, but there should be a collaborative process, a discussion. Now, um, I'm going to talk about uh, cancer as cellular attention deficit disorder. Cancer as a confused process, as an antisocial confused process. And uh, the goal is to not kill, in my opinion, the cancer cell. The goal is to help the patient reintegrate all the instruments in its orchestra. And uh, I like Dr. Moon showed us that one adenoma became a polyp. You heard that. And so that's kind of what we should be paying attention to, is not killing these cancers, but like the, like the teacher who, um, like the teacher who has a bunch of ADHD kids, she doesn't take them out back and shoot them. You know, she says, how can I bring some resources to bear to help these people go along? Now, I think I'm stuck. Is this going to work? Technicals, oh, here we go. Um, all right, so I'm sorry to have uh, delayed us here. So does that, I mean, I'm not, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know, but I hope that I'm sharing with you that it's of primary importance in my practice. And in my experience, uh, I, get, um, I get far better results than I would have expected. And I think it has to do with some of that, some of that orientation. All right. Now, the computer here, who's, who's helping with this computer? Because I'm terrible with computers. It says starting Windows. So I'll just wait. All right. Um, so let me summarize what I'm going to tell you about. I'm going to, I'm going to summarize that, that what's very important in my administrative of, administrations of medicine, password, All right. Um, yeah. I'll just stand back and let someone who knows about that do that. Um, so, so one of the things to pay attention to is cancer stem cells. Max Witcher, uh, if, what I'm going to talk about is already posted on my website. So the PowerPoints are available at weeksclinic.com weeksclinic.com and then a uh, maybe there's a section that says learn and then there's lectures by Dr. Weeks and then this is posted and um, the, the tragedy is that when IPT is delivered without paying attention to addressing the cancer stem cells then we're really simply uh, profiting I believe at the expense of the patient because we're not going after the cancer stem cells are considered the only cells that can metastasize, for example. I, I didn't know that about four years ago. But all metastatic disease is considered now to be a cancer stem cell process. So in the tumor, like a riot out on the street, you have, you have an, an instigator, a ringleader, 
you have a, a bunch of lieutenants, and then you have a bunch of people who are just kind of watching the process. So the intelligent sheriff would go and say to the, to the bystanders, things are going to get ugly. I would go home if I were you. And chances are they will. And then the sheriff would go to the lieutenants and say, I don't know how loyal you are to your boss, but we're going to take him out. This is your chance to go. They would disappear. And then when you confront the ringleader, the bravado is gone, and the tumor, in this case, uh, what I'm trying to say is that the tumor is the surrounding cells. They've been caught up in the fray. Cancer tumor cells are not dangerous. They can grow so that sterically they can comprise, they can compromise some vital function, you know, comp uh, compress the aorta. But the cancer tumor cells are not, never have been dangerous. The, uh, somebody referenced the fact that cancer tumor size is not an indication of uh, longevity. We have to watch out for the cancer stem cells, which I submit are the ringleaders. These are some of my friends. I wanted to have, uh, I just think we always have to, when we lecture, remember how fortunate we are for the pioneers who took the arrows in the backs for us to allow us to sit here and, uh, and share. Uh, the, this was written in 1958, and it basically says that nothing arouses so much bitter enmity and heated arguments among colleagues as the subject of cancer. This may be due to the guilty recollections of cancer victims expiring who might have been saved, or of the memories of patients pronounced hopelessly ill who recovered. These guilt reactions are what make it so hard to have reasonable discussions with our oncology colleagues. We have to have, the theme of this talk is the war is over, right? The war against cancer is over. Well, the war against our oncology colleagues should be over too. These people get out of bed every morning and they try to do the best they can. They're not as fortunate as we are to have had mentors like we had. So if we can get away from the war mentality all the way along, and this is a, this is a little quotation which shows how difficult